بشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما ألمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في أول كلامنا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في أوسط كلامنا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في آخر كلامنا صلى الله على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم My dear respected brothers and elders Alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He guided us He gifted us with an amazing blessing What is that blessing? Can anyone tell me? Iman So many souls are in darkness How many souls are in darkness? You know the ratio of Muslims to non-Muslims You know how many other Does anyone know the ratio? I'm not going to do all the talking today, guys. Yeah, something different today. Yeah, normally it's just salam alaikum and let's go for it. Yeah. So what is the ratio? Come on, someone. One to six, one to seven. One to seven. Okay, recently. Look, just think for a second. Just think for a second, yeah. Out of all the souls that are created in this world at one time now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He chose you to be a Muslim. Isn't that something? And doesn't that mean anything to you? You know, sit down. It's a special night tonight. Sit down and ponder over this. Ponder over this. Why has Allah given you Iman? What is it? Is it the way we dress? There's some amazing people, mashallah, out there. Conor McGregor. Look at the way he dresses. Sick guy. I'm just saying. Is it the way we dress? Is it our bank balances? Many of us are in zeros. Yeah? Is it because of our bank balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Iman for us? Is it because of the flash car that we drive? What is it? Why has Allah created us as Muslims? You know, we sit and think about everything. Why don't we think about this? Do you know why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chosen me? You speak to people, mashallah, you know, so many people that we know, so many people come into the fold of Islam, so many people come into the fold of Islam, they speak to you, they deal with you, they see you, they interact with you, and they love the way you are. I'm talk not talking about me, I'm talking about other people. They love Muslims, they're kind, they're well-mannered, you understand, and they come into the fold of Islam. Yeah, when you get them to say the shahada, when you say, say, repeat after me a number of times, when you say to them, repeat after me, ashhadu, they say ashhadu, an la ilaha, an la ilaha, they burst into tears. Find me one person that has not burst into tears. Find me one person that has accepted Islam yet not cried. It's a gift from Allah. Yeah, when we walk around, follow la ilaha illallah, we have no feelings. There's nothing there. You say Allahu Akbar, you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you say Allahu Akbar, you feel virtually nothing. How many times have you read Surah Fatiha? How many times have you read Surah Fatiha? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So many tafasir have just been written just on the bar, you know, for Bismillah, for bar, the dot. On the dot of Ba, so many tafasir. But how many of us stand up and when we read Surah Fatiha or when we listen to the Imam reciting Surah Fatiha, how many of us feel the real power of Surah Fatiha? No one. You're thinking, oh, I need to get milk tonight. I've got to go shop. Where am I going to get burgers from? Where are the tastiest burgers? I'm trying to explain to you the difference. I have never come across one person that has said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and accepted Islam and not cried. Yeah, yeah we're, we're born Muslims. Why does the kalima have no effect on me and you? Why? It's something to think about. Has Allah put a seal on our heart? Why is it that when we go to Makkah al-Mukarramah and you cry behind the Imam over there, when you, hear, when you recite them, when you hear them reciting Surah Fatiha, why is it that you cry over there? Yet over here there's no feeling. 
when someone reads Surah Fatiha, it's all right. It's okay. Hurry up, Molly. I've got shopping to do. I've got to go to Asda. Do you understand? So there's something wrong somewhere. There's something that's missing. There's something wrong. Everything's not just cool. Everything's not just cool. If you are not feeling the power of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, trust me guys, there is something wrong with me. And we're not willing to change that. We're not willing to change. A person that has memorized four surah at the age of seven or eight, 35, 40 years on, it's just the same four surahs. It's just the same four surahs. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, you speak to so many people. And how many surahs have you learned over the years? Oh, Jariya Maalbine na minus kaya huya si. Maalbine. Yeah. Jariya Maalbine na minus kaya huya si. Oh, hey, minu yada. Oh, kariya surah ta huya. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. So we're not willing to make a change. And that's dangerous. Don't you think that's dangerous? That's seriously dangerous. We need to worry. Look, picture yourself 30 years ago. You were living with your parents. You were living with your example. I'm just saying, whether you're from here, Pakistan, wherever you're from, you were living with your parents. In this dunya, with the materialistic world, you have tried. I'll give you my example. I'll, say, I'll give you a simple example so you can understand. Years ago, 30, 40 years ago, I was living with mum and dad. And then we move on, and then it was a small house, then you want a bigger house, then you want a bigger house. There was a Nissan Micra, famous Apnea Guardian. Yeah, my dad had a Datsun, then it was a Nissan Micra, then moving on. And now it's a bigger car. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we make progress regarding dunya. Why do we not make progress regarding deen? Think. Why do we not better ourselves? Why do we not want to get closer to Allah? Allah is the creator. Allah is the fashioner. Allah is the designer. Look, two people sitting in this room, their faces don't match. Everyone's got a face, but their eyes don't match. The nose, the teeth, the face, the beard, the build, everything's different. Who's doing this? Allah is doing this. Do we not owe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything? How long are you going to carry on running away from Allah? What's it going to take for you to turn to Allah? Do we have to lose a loved one? Do you have to bury your child? And then you're going to turn to Allah. Does a calamity have to happen in my life? Which calamity has to happen in my life? Then I'm going to turn to Allah. What needs to happen? One, many people you speak to, so they say that this happened in my life. Allah has always been there. Why should it take something bad to happen for you to turn to Allah? That's the question. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's there. He loves a human being. He's saying to you, come and worship me. Yabna Adam, O son of Adam, tafarrag li ibadati. Take some time out for my worship. Yabna Adam, O son of Adam, tafarrag li ibadati. Yeah? Take some time out for my Worship. And then what does it say after that? Amla sadraka ghinan wa asudda faqra. That you know all these desires that you have inside your heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will fulfill them. He will fulfill them. Who is the doer of everything? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know that worry that we have that where am I going to eat from tomorrow? Wa asudda faqra. Wa asudda faqra. Where am I going to eat from tomorrow? Allah says, I will get rid of all your issues. Who's saying this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ibn Adam tafarraq li ibadati amla sadraka ghinan wa asudda faqra. I'll get rid of everything. You won't have to worry. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a lot to be content. You can have small, you can have very little bit and you can be content. You can have two pairs of clothes, you can have a car that takes you. Look, someone travels in, someone travels in business class. And they're sitting on your plane, Qatar, yeah? Example. You're going to get on and off at the same time if you're, traveling in a, if you're not traveling in a business class, aren't you? If you're traveling in an economy class, you're still going to get off. Yeah, they're going to have a little bit of a better ride. But they're, gonna, they're not going to get there quicker than you. They're not going to get there 
faster than you. You're going to get there at the same time. They're going to get there at the same time. So having a lot doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, you know, life's going to be brilliant. You understand? There are so many people that have dojo, they kapare, they have a job, a little bit of roti pani and everything, and they're living their life. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa illa taf'al. If you do not take time out for my worship, malatu yadayka shughlan. I will busy you in things. And then I will call, wa asudda wa lam asudda faqrak. Then you will be troubled. Then everything you touch, you will struggle. This is what we're trying to explain to ourselves today is, why are we struggling today? Because we're not giving Allah time. We're not giving Allah time. We're not willing to turn to Allah. We do everything. You know, we hear, Hanji, make it, make it, make it. You did nothing. Allah's the one that did it. There's people that touch gold, it turns to soil. There's people that touch soil, it turns to gold. So who's doing all this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing this. I was giving this example today in a, a talk that we did today. Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves every single one of us. And these masajids, these are houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, these are masajids. Masajids, these are houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like we have houses, just like we have houses. There's three types of visitors that visit our house. How many types of visitors? Three types of visitors that visit our house, my house, your house. There's one, understand the example carefully. So I have my house, I'm the owner of my house. This house is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's. So there's one visitor that comes to my house, example. When he walks in through that door, I'm absolutely loving it. I'm saying, chill out. What do you want to eat? Do you want to eat this? Do you want to drink this? What do you want? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? He's in my house. And I'm trying to make his life as much comfortable as possible because I want to spend time with him. I want to spend time with him. And we have a laugh, we have a joke. When he says that I'm going to get up and go, I feel sad. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't want him to go. In the same way, these houses are the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person comes to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he reads salah, when he reads Quran, when he does the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the visitor of who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to keep him inside. So as long as he stays busy, he is the visitor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the person like that. So many people come inside the masjid, they stay from Asr till Isha. Correct me if I'm wrong. They stay till Asr, they do Tasbih till Maghrib, then after Maghrib, they stay till Isha. Allah loves a person like that. In the same way that we love a person that comes to our house. There's another person that comes to the house of Allah. In the same way, there's another person that comes to our house. When he walks through that door, he's on his phone. Where is he? He's on his phone. You put food in front of him, he's dipping his biscuit in salam. Where is he dipping his biscuit? In salam. Yeah, he's looking at his phone and he's dipping his biscuit in the salad and he's eating it. And he's saying, both nice, both nice job. And he doesn't know he's tasting salad. He's not interested. He's just come to your house. He's rushing around. You say to him, akala, akala, akala. Oh, haji, haji, haji. Takes a bite of a biscuit. You've got a nice big cup of tea. He drinks a little bit, puts it around. He's on his mobile phone here, there. Haji, haji, haji. And he's sitting on hot coal. And he's dying to get out. He's abs we have friends like that. And I say to them, what was the use of coming? You haven't ate anything, you haven't drunk anything, you don't want to do anything. You haven't even had a chat with me, you're just on the phone and what's up? What was the use of coming? In the same way, many people populate the masjid in the same way. They're walking through the door, they've got the mobile in their hand. They're walking, the Imam Sahib has said, Allahu Akbar. They're walking up to the, you know, the saf, and they're on their phone. We'll say Allah in Ramadan. They're walking up to the staff and they're on their mobile phone, social media. What are we eating tonight? Where are we going? KFC, YFC, where are we going? Do you understand? So there's people, there's people that populate the masjid and they're like this as well. They're like this as well. They're coming to the masjid, they're not interested. They're just doing their own stuff. And then, you know, this is the most scariest part. There's one type of visitor that we don't want in our house. You would never want him. You know him. You know him but you would never want him to come inside your house in the same way we come across many people that say, Masjid Khan Jawi, why should we go to mosque? 
they do not understand that it's not them that are not coming, Allah is not calling them. Allah doesn't want them. So did you understand the example of the three visitors? There's one that comes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want him to leave. There's one that comes messing about. Do you understand? Even I'm not talking about kids. I don't mind kids messing about. I'm talking about elderly people, youngsters. They just come, sit on the side, messing about, wasting their time. Social media, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, Patani Kiki. Do you understand? So they waste their time. And the most scariest part is there's one person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, many people say that I don't come to the mosque, I haven't got time to pray. Go on namaz pray, go on zikr kare, go on, you know, Ramzan, mitrabiyah pray. You know, we've heard so many people say that, why should we read tarawees? It's tiring. You can stand at work at a petrol station 12 hours, that's not tiring. That doesn't tire you out, mashallah, bodybuilders standing there. But in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one hour, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it tires you out. So now, I want you to picture, what sort of visitor am I? You know, do I just come occasionally? Or do I just come occasionally when I feel like it, I come. When things get bad in my life, then I come. When things go wrong in my life, then I come. And then, you know, when, if you're in bigger masajids and stuff like that, you know that there's something wrong going on in this person's life because they come in and they sit against the radio. Mashallah, all you guys are sitting against radios. I'm not talking about you guys. You guys are, mashallah, smashed it. You guys are on a level. Yeah, mashallah. So you know that this, this person has come in something wrong now. Then you have to ask him, Assalamu alaikum, how are you, brother? Everything all right? Oh, Maulana Sahib, you don't know. We don't know, we'll tell me then, innit? So look, don't be seasonal Muslims. What does a seasonal Muslim mean? That on a special night, you know, you come to the masjid. In Ramadan, you populate the masjid. The same Allah that we worship in the month of Ramadan. The same Allah that we worship in the month of Ramadan is the same Allah out of Ramadan. But what goes wrong? Is it something to do with the moon? You know, we turn into werewolves. <coughs> I'm only joking. What happens to us? What goes wrong? Why do we come up to the night of Eid and then we disappear? So it's something to think about. Number one, Whenever you think of coming to the masjid, remember one thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling you. You are the visitor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, fashioner, designer, sustainer, giver, taker. He's everything. He gives you everything. Okay? Number two, listen. The other thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks for every single excuse to forgive you and me. Allah looks for every single excuse. For what? To forgive you and me. The people, the creation, they look for every single excuse to do you over. What do they look for? Every single excuse to do you over, to do you wrong. You understand? To judge you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will look. He is looking and he will look for every single excuse to forgive you. Even on the day of judgment. Even on the day of judgment. I was reading a post the other day and it says, How dumb is it? that people are still judging you for the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already forgiven you for. How dumb is it? For people to still judge you about the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already forgiven you for. So the point I'm trying to make over here now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for every single excuse to forgive you and me. Let's have a look why. Let's have a look how. Many of us don't even know. Let's have a look how. When you are sitting at home, and you've got a can of coke, nice box of pizza. You've got that sofa with the, you can't afford them yet, yeah? But that sofa that goes back and the legs go up and you're sitting back and you're chilling out. Your family's cruising. You're watching ARY TV. I'm giving an example, yeah? We won't say about other movies or something, right? And then the call of Adhan comes. And you know it's time for Asr or you know it's time for Maghrib and you know it's time for Isha, okay? And the thought comes inside your head that I need to read Salah you're rewarded there and then. Allah's rewarded you there and then. The thought comes. Just the thought. That, yeah, Allah, I need to read the mass. You haven't even said anything to anyone. Yeah, the thought. The reward's there. إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ That doesn't necessarily mean that you stay sitting there and you say, you know, Mawlana Khalid came and he said, you get the reward, so we're not going to go for the mass. بَيْتَ نِيتَنْ كَرْدَيْرَوَا Yeah. بَيْتَ نِيتَنْ كَرْدَيْرَوَا So it doesn't, nothing like that. So you have to, then you get up, then you get up 
Then you go to perform your wudu. Then you go, just giving a simple example. Then you go to perform your wudu. You are washing your hands. What does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? When you are washing your hands, the sins that you have committed with your hands, they are falling off your hands. Yeah? And then you are washing the inside of your mouth. When you're washing the inside of your mouth, the sins that you have committed with your mouth, you had a kick off with your mom and dad. Yeah? Allah wiping the sin clean. And of course, if Allah is wiping the sin clean, then Allah will give you realization and then you will go back to your parents and you will ask for forgiveness. In the same way, you wash your nose, the sins are being taken out. You wash your face. What happens when you wash your face then? Anyone? Come on. What happens when you wash your face? Yeah, the sins that you have committed with your eyes, they are all falling off. So, so far, are you losing? No, you're gaining. Then you wash your arms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wipes all the sins that you committed with your arms. You do masa. You wash your feet. You wash your feet. When you wash your feet, what happens after you wash your feet? All the sins that you committed whilst you were walking towards these sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wiping them clean. Amazing part. You come out of the bathroom. You say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabin. Wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirin. Imagine this. Think. Kabi asabi socho. The eight doors of Jannah are opened for you. Don't you want that? Do you not want that? Can you not think like that? When you come out of the bathroom or when you do wuzu over here, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabin. Wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirin. All the eight doors of Jannah, they are opened for you. Isn't that something to think, wow, isn't that what I want? Or are you just going to stick to a 55-inch TV? <laughs> I want a 55-inch TV. These are things that you should be aiming for. So look, all your sins have been wiped. Then the doors of Jannah are open. Then you've done wuzu. Of course you're going to come to the masjid, aren't you? You're walking towards the masjid. Every single step you take, you are being rewarded. Now, a person asked me the other day, I'll start Saba come in a car. Well, as many times as the wheels go around, chill, man, you're still getting reward. We've got two feet, you've got four wheels, unless you come on a motorbike or a bike. Do you understand? So the reward is there. Every step you take, you are getting reward. One sin is being forgiven. You come inside the masjid. You come inside the masjid. What's your name, brother? Azhar. I come inside the masjid, I say, Assalamu alaikum, Azhar, how are you? We shake hands. Before our hands are released, Allah forgives all our sins. Are you at a loss? Allah is willing to give. Then you come inside the masjid. Allahumma aftahli abwa wa rahmatik. Then you sit down. And then you know there's five minutes left for namaz. You're waiting for salah. It is like you are in salah. You're waiting for salah, is it? I think like this sometimes as well. That look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you. Do you understand? So you're waiting for salah, you're getting reward. Then you stand in salah, when you say Allahu Akbar, all those sins that you have committed, they've all, you throw them all back. When you go into ruku, they fall off your shoulders. When you stand up again from coma, they've fallen off. When you go in sajda, they've fallen off. When you say Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, then you read Ayatul Kursi, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. You read Ayatul Kursi straight after Farah Salah. Make this a habit. Make this a habit. There is nothing that will stop you entering paradise but your death. Anyone that makes a habit of Ayatul Kursi, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. La ta'akhuduhu sinatum wa la nawm. Lahumma fi samawati wa Finish it to the end. It takes a minute. But if you were to pass away between the next, between this salah and the other salah, you are guaranteed Jannah. Allah is giving, but there's no one to take. We say, Assalamu alaikum. This is what happens. We say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Where does your hand go? It goes in your pocket. Yeah? What comes out before the other salam? Your mobile phone. What comes out? Your mo you haven't even done salam yet. Your mobile phone comes out. You're not that famous, guys. You're not going to get a message after. You can wait. 
Rüya salam. Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum rahmetullah. Assalamu alaikum rahmetullah. And then check your phone. If only we, instead of pulling the phone out after salah, if only we recited Ayatul Kursi. If only we recited Ayatul Kursi. So look guys, the month of Ramadan is coming. You give it two weeks, two weeks from now. Are you going to carry on living the life that you have lived up until today? Is this Ramadan just going to be another Ramadan? I was speaking to someone the other day, he goes, Ramadan's coming, he goes, what's going to change? He goes, I'm going to go sleep, loads and loads of sleep. He goes, you're going to go into hibernation. <laughs> so I'm like an animal, go sleep. Look, Ramadan is to take from the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a special night tonight as well. Many people, I'm going to explain to you a few things about tonight and then we'll move on to a bit of Ramadan inshallah as well. But look, many Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een have narrated, there's about 10 to 17 Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een that have mentioned from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the, about the importance of tonight, which is 15th of Shaban. Yeah, 10 to 17 Sahaba, many people say there's no you know, there's nothing in tonight, but 10 to 17 Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een have narrated about the importance of tonight. Okay, now if one person just said it, like for example, if one person comes and tells me something, and then I think maybe, you understand, if two, three, four, if there's 10 to 17 people that have mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned about the importance of tonight, then this night holds some kind of importance. Okay, on this night in a hadith it says, although these, all these ahadiths are weak, okay, all these ahadiths are weak, but because it's been mentioned so many times, and because so many sahaba, tabi'i, tabi tabi'in, have, you know, done amal on this, meaning they have practiced worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night, it becomes very important for us that on some kind of level, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night. In one hadith it says that on this night all the pers all the people that are gonna what do you call it come into this world and leave this world, you know, and the risk and everything is handed out to the angels. And it says in this same hadith that a person, like in the tashri of this hadith, that a person is getting married. A person is getting married. Yeah, he doesn't know he's walking the face of this earth and he's a dead man in the accounts of Allah. He's walking the face of this earth, but he's a dead man. Walking in the eyes of the angels, a person is doing, is buying his house, he's signed up for his house, you know what I'm But in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's a dead man walking. So many, in a hadith it says that in this night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hands, you know, all the, all the things that are going to go on with many individuals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hands this to, many, uh, to the angels. On this night, what sort of worship should, should we do, okay? It's nothing special, guys. You know, it's nothing special that we have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to go out of our way and we have to do some different type of thing on this night. It's the same thing. Look, this night we have to build our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an individual. As an individual. This, this night should be a connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This night should be a connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for all my shortcomings that I have done in my entire life. And Ya Allah, the month of Ramadan is coming very soon. And I'm going to try and sort myself out. And I'm going to try to put things in place. Do you understand? So on this night, many people say that should we read Salat al-Tasbih? You can read Salat al-Tasbih, there's no issue with that. Whatever the, there's no special Salah in this night. Let me just tell you this. There's no special Salah in this night. But if someone wants to read Salat al-Tasbih, there's nothing wrong with that. Read it individually, you understand? Read Nawafil, read Quran, read some Quran. And I'll tell you one other thing as well. You know, I, I was just saying this today as well, and I'll mention it to you as well. That look, make it a habit of reading Surah Mulk. Make it a habit of reading Surah Mulk, Surah Tabarak al -Ladhi. Which Sipara is Surah Tabarak al in 27 or 28? Huh? 29, sorry. Yeah, which Sipara is it in? It's in 29. Surah Tabarak al -Ladhi. What is the benefit of reading Surah Tabarak al -Ladhi? Look, today we're alive. We don't even know if we're going to make it till Isha. The reality is. 
But the first place that we are going to go after we leave this world is lowered into the grave. That's our next stop. When you pass away, no one's going to take you home. Wherever you are. Pass away in the hospital, you pass away wherever you are, no one's going to bring you home. No one's going to bring you home. No one's going to say, take dad, take brother, take my son into his bedroom. You passed away now. You don't matter now. You don't matter now. Okay? So after this, the first place that you are going to be lowered into is your grave. And trust me, guys, it's only going to be you and your good deeds or bad deeds. It's only going to be you or you and your good deeds or your bad deeds. All the people that love you today, they're not going to read for you. The reality. If you think that your family members are going to sit and remember you after you have left this world, you are living in cuckoo land. You need to wake up. How many of us, our parents, remember their parents? How many? How many of our parents' parents remember their parents? How often? How often? When do you hear about them mentioning them? How many of us have lost brothers? How many of us have lost sisters? How many of us have lost loved ones, children? But how often do you remember them? No one remembers them. One, two weeks, three weeks, every year, once or twice on the day they passed away. And apart from that, nothing. What you have to remember is it's you yourself in the grave. Picture this. Tonight, when you get time and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, picture this. It's only you in your grave. It's only you in your grave. No one is going to send you one subhanallah. I have been to Khatam. You know what I mean by Khatam? It's where you, everyone does it. You know, like, chalo, Quran paro, Quran paro, and isko bakhsh do. One of the last ones that I went to, everyone had a sifara. Everyone had a sifara. 13 lines on a, in a, on a side. 13 lines on a side, big A4 side. The Quran, we're supposed to be reading one line, two lines, three lines, four lines. Correct me if I'm wrong. I've seen a person with my own eyes, a loved one that has passed away. He was reading just the top line. The first page, top line. The second page, top line. Turn the page. In three minutes, the whole sifara finished. Said so you smashed it, bro. Hey, ni cheti parliya. Yeah. Morda jo hoga cover me, wo to tarap raha hoga. This is. Can you imagine someone sending you something like this? So the point that I'm trying to make, guys, is look, please, I beg you, it's you in your grave. It's no one else in your grave. You know the mother that loves you. She ain't gonna come in the grave. Your father that loves you. Of course, the respect is there. The respect is there. But no one can save you. In your grave, it's you and your grave. And I don't understand. When are we going to understand this? Because once you're lowered in the grave, and then you say, Ya Allah, send me back. I'll stay in the masjid of Keithley. And you know that corner over there? It's only going to be me and you. Then it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. You're not going to get a chance. So look, today we are alive. Your eyes are open. You can speak. You can walk. You can talk. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. You can do everything. Make it a habit for yourself to read Surah Mulk, Surah Tabarak al three and a half sides. If, if you struggle today and it takes you 10 minutes to read it, if you struggle today and it takes you 10 minutes, even if it takes you half an hour today to read Sasta Sadahe, because when you go into the grave, and if you are going to be punished by the angels, or if any type of punishment is going to come towards you, Surah Tabarak al will cover you, protect you. We used to be kids. We used to be kids years ago. We used to get into loads of fights, yeah? Because we had a friend that was big, yeah? Whenever we used to get into a fight, start it off and everything, right? And say, come on, come on, and come for us, come for us. And we said, mate, come here. Big guy, and the guy opposite used to say, Ren, they know, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not going to fight him. Forget it, leave it. Now, I'm just giving you a simple example. Imagine you're lowered into the grave, and then the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming your way. And Surah Tabarak al in a beautiful form, says, You cannot touch this person. You've made it. That person that is not punished in his grave, all, his, all the stages after, you might scrape through, you know, I'm not scraped through, you might fall down, get up, fall down, get up, but you'll get there. Surah Tabarakallah will say that, Ya Allah, if you are going to punish this person, 
then take me out of the Quran. Will Allah do that? No, three and a half sides. Today it might take you half an hour. Today it might take you 15 minutes. Today it might take you 20 minutes. But a time will come, you will drive your car two and a half minutes from here to home, or you will walk home and you will read Surah Tabarak al like this. Like this. Surah Yaseen, after Fajr Salah, when I read Surah Yaseen, when I know exactly when I leave the masjid, I'm going to be on Wamali ala Abdullah. You understand? Because two rakus I'm going to read inside. So, like from the, when I'm inside my car, I'm going to read the bottom of the page. When I'm starting my car, when I'm at home, turning the key, when I'm inside my bed, fucked up, the last few ayah. These are things that we need to be aiming for. Look, no one's saying don't make money. I'm not saying to you don't make money. The Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, they were really, really rich. Really, really rich. Do you understand? And even when they passed away, they had to put the golden bars with saws. Imagine how rich they were. So no one is saying you cannot earn money. All we're saying, all we're saying to ourselves and yourselves is keep a balance. Deen and dunya. Deen and dunya. Keep a nice balance. Look, the way you live your life is the way you're going to die. And we see it all the time. We see it all the time. There's a, there's a brother, 56 years old. His name was Amjad. His name was Amjad. And um, what used to happen was, what used to happen with this brother, right, is five times he used to read Salah in any given masjid, in any given masjid. I was an imam at this masjid for two and a half years. Fajr and Isha, Fajr and Isha. He was the pillar of that masjid. He used to walk in for Fajr, he used to walk in for Isha. I always never used to. He never missed. I was there seven days. Fajr and Isha, he never missed. And I used to say to him, Amjad, how do you do it? And he says that, he used to say to me, he used to say, Maulana, he says, I used to go, I go sleep at night. And he says, I get up for tahajjud. Every night I get up for tahajjud. He says, I read my little bit. Then I read my little wazifa. And then he goes, I come for Fajr Salah. I come for Fajr Salah. Right. This is, why am I telling you this, is the way you live your life. That's exactly how you're going to leave, your, leave this world. So, the two and a half years that I was there, he was, of course, he was popular in the masjid before that. He was there reading uh, namaz all the time. And one other thing that he said to me, he says, Malana, he says, I always stay in wuzu. I always stay in wuzu. And you know when people say you can always stay in wuzu, I only found that very easy in Pakistan, you know, when it's 44 degrees. You can only, I only could stay in wuzu there that Over here you can't But he used to say that I always stay in wuzu Okay He left from my local masjid for umrah He left my local masjid for umrah Remember one thing, no complications No nothing, nothing Perfect, nothing, alhamdulillah They stopped at Turkey Him and his family, they stopped at Turkey He went to do his, you know, shower and bath to put his ihram on. To do what? To put his ihram on. So he coming at the top of the escalators, he had just performed wudu, all his body parts are wet. All his body parts are wet. So he's coming from the top of the escalators, his sons are waiting at the bottom, he collapses at the top, and by the time he reaches the bottom, they say he's no more. He's finished. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And what did they say? They say he's no more. But my question to you is, for him to die or pass away in this state, Allah must have loved something about him. Is that right? He saved the time. You tell me in today's time and age, Fajr is at 4.45, 5 o'clock, is it easy to come for Fajr? Is it easy to come for Fajr? Sometimes, you know, you get up 4 o'clock and you think, oh, half an hour left. And you move to the other side and before you know it, it's 7 o'clock. Yeah? Sometimes you go home after Maghrib and you sit down and you have a nice meal and you say, Oh, ki jana isha namaz li ayta ya jfarlo Allah maaf karana ala gafoor ur rahim Allah is gafoor ur rahim Yeah, gosh ni unda maaf kar si Yeah? But the point that I'm trying to make is for him to leave this world in this way It's not by chance, is it? On the day of judgment, how will he rise? His body parts will be wet With what? Wudu and in the state of, you know, the intention of Umrah. So guys, for this, we have to make, you have to do something. You cannot never turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, I'm going to die in the masjid in the sijda. One of the masjids that I was teaching in a while ago, 
They said a few years back, a guy walked in, a guy regular for the masjid, and he walked in and he's praying salah. He went into sajda and he never got up. But don't you want a death like that? Everyone wants a death like that. But you have to live a life like that. Same thing again tonight, what do you call it, a special night. So there's no special worship. You can read Quran, do dhikr. You understand? And it's about you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's only one hadith which is found about Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he's been into the graveyard. He went to the graveyard on the 15th night of Shaban. There's only one hadith. And if you don't want to go to the graveyard, I'm not saying that class it as sunnah. You understand? If you don't want to go to the graveyard, go in the daytime. I'm saying on a regular basis, go in the daytime. Remember death. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went one night, this night. Many people practice. Many people go in large groups. Many people, there was a video that was going around a while ago and a large group of people went into the graveyard, the non-Muslims area, and then they were chanting, you know, certain things, you know, like, even, I don't know who it was, but don't you think this is causing an issue or causing problems to non-Muslims that are sleeping? So he went on Facebook, he went on YouTube. So you don't need to do stuff like that. If you want to go to the graveyard, go do the work for them. The reward that you're going to send the people that are in the graves, you can send from here. You can send from your home. Do you understand? The fasting tomorrow, the fasting of tomorrow, many in uh, a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast the whole of Shaban. The whole of Shaban, apart from the last two days. Okay? On the 13th, 14th, and 15th, the fasting, Ayyam Ibiz, we call it, 13, 14, and 15. If you fast on these days, the Sunnah anywhere, and then Monday and Thursday as well. So to fast tomorrow, if anyone wants to keep the fast, that's fine. Do you understand? But I wouldn't class it as the ulama hasn't classed it as sunnah. You know, the fasts of Shaban, if anyone wants to keep the fasts of Shaban, fast in Shaban. And you know, preparation for the month of Ramadan. What do you need to do from the month of Ramadan? You need to start worrying about it now. You need to start planning every single thing now. You need to plan day to day. Like on the first day, what am I going to do? The second day, if I'm at work, what do I need to eat? What do I need to drink? What do I need to do? Do you understand? So these are the things that we need to do in the month of Ramadan as well. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, read your salah, be good. And the power that you will get in the month of Ramadan, it will last for 11 months. It will last for 11 months. In the same way, giving charity, giving in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One last story and then we'll call it a day, inshaAllah. Giving the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone has heard of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi alayhi. Everyone has heard of Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahmatullahi alayhi. It says about Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahmatullahi alayhi, before he was made Amir al-Mu'mineen, Amir al-Mu'mineen in them days is equivalent to a king today. Yeah, before he was made Amir al-Mu'mineen, was very, very rich, living his own lifestyle. But then when he was appointed as the Amir, the leader of the believers, his life changed. He put everything in Bayt al-Mal. He put everything in the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help people. And this one story that I was just listening today, it says about him, the reason why I'm saying you this is in the month of Ramadan, give charity, you know, help the people. There's so many people in UK. Look, I'll tell you one other thing. We send our zakat money abroad. We send our zakat money abroad, didn't it? There's so many people in UK that are entitled to zakat. There's so many people. They don't come forward as Muslims. They don't, they don't come forward because they, they don't even go to food banks. They don't even go to food banks because out of shame that what are people gonna think? But they're struggling. They're struggling. There's so many people that you can help. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi alayhi, it says, a woman, she traveled from Iraq. A woman, she traveled from Iraq to Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi alayhi. She says, I came to the door. I came to the door of the king of that time. And she says, ke maine dekha ke darwaze ke ufar ek purana taat laga hua hai. There's an old curtain on the door. So she says, I knocked on the door. And she says, this woman came to the door. And she says that, I said to her that I've come from Iraq. And I want to meet Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the Amir al-Mu'mineen. Because my husband's passed away. And my four daughters, I've got four daughters. So I want him to help me. I want him to help me. So that woman, she says, that the woman that opened the curtain, she says, come inside. I went inside. She said, I, look, I looked around inside the house. There was nothing inside the house. There was a broken bed. And there was nothing inside the house. 
So I thought to myself, is this the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen? Is this the house of the king? Coming inside the house, looking inside the house, he hasn't got anything. What's he going to give me? How's he going to help me? So anyway, she says, I went inside and I sat on her side. She says, the woman that opened the curtain as the door, she says, I looked at her, she went, and you know, there was a well and there was barthan, you know, like pots and pans. She says, she started cleaning them. She started cleaning them. So I thought in my head that Umar bin Abdul Aziz and his wife, this woman is her servant, is her servant. So she says, I waited there, I sat there, I looked at that woman, I was waiting there. And then she says, I seen a person rushing in from the door. So I thought to myself that this person is the husband of that woman that's cleaning up. So he rushed inside and the woman that was cleaning the pots and pans, she said to him that, where have you been? all this time, like we get questioned by the wife all the time, where have you been? <laughs> yeah. So she said to him, where have you been? I have been waiting for you over here so that you can bring some kind of liquid or something so we can clean the burden. So he said, I just got caught up somewhere. So the woman that's come to visit from Iraq, she's sitting down, she's looking at him. So he goes and sits down. She says he gets this old cloth and she, he wipes the sweat off his forehead. And then he says to the woman that's cleaning that give me something to eat. So the woman that's cleaning, she says, she says that there's only last night's roti. There's only last night's roti and vinegar. He says, bring me that. So he brings, she brings vinegar and she brings a roti. She says, I'm looking at this man and I'm thinking he's a servant and he's cleaning, he's eating away, he's eating, he's finished, he wipes his mouth. Then she says, the woman that's cleaning up, she comes to me and she says, that is Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Talk to him. Whatever you want to ask him, ask him. So Umar bin Abdul Aziz, you know, he says to her that, what's your issue? So she says, Umar, she says, I've got four daughters. I've come all the way from Iraq. My husband has passed away. Can you help me? So inside her head, she's thinking, if he writes for me as a wazifa, you know, like as benefit, if he writes for me 100 dinar a year for one child, that is enough. Why is she thinking inside her head? If he writes for me 100 dinar a year for one child, that's enough for me. Then I can go back to Iraq, I can give that person, the governor, the token, and I can take the money. She says, when I said this to him, that can you help me? He sa she says that Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahmatullahi alayhi, tears started flowing from his eyes. He started to cry. So she said to him, what's wrong? He says, I'm very, very sorry. I have put you in so much difficulty that you have had to come to me. It was my job to come to you. It was my job to come to you. You know, we see so many times you go to someone and you say, you know, can you help me? And they say, do you know who I am? They say, oh, Baj Dasi, can you help me? <laughs> yeah. No one's interested. But look, he was a king. He was a king. So she says, and look, everything that, one of the points that I'm trying to make over here now, everything that they did was for the sake of Allah, was for the pleasure of Allah. She says, I wanted 100 dinars of him. He picked his pen and he started writing, daughter number one, 1,000 dinar. How many? 1,000 Look at himself. What has he ate? What has he ate? He's ate last night's roti. What's he dipped it in? Vinegar. And he's written how much over here? 1,000 dinar. When he writes 1,000 dinar, that woman over there, she's sitting there and she says, Ya Allah, I thank you. Who does she thank? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he writes, daughter number two, 1,000 dinar. So she says, Ya Allah, I thank you. Then he writes, daughter number three, 1,000 dinar. And she says, Ya Allah, I thank you. She's got four daughters. He writes, daughter number four, 1,000 dinars. He's writing this, 1,000 dinars. She says, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, she says, I thank you. I thank you. He stops. He doesn't write anymore. He says, you know, the 3,000 dirham dinar that I have given you, share it between your four daughters. Because he says, before you were thanking Allah, before you were thanking Allah, but now you have mentioned my name and we, I can't do anything without the command of Allah. I am not giving you this. Allah is giving you this. But now there's some type of riya. I'm feeling myself that I'm helping you. So because of this, I'm not going to give you the extra 1,000. So you take the 3,000 and share it between your daughters. 
Okay? So look, there's two things over here. Look, helping the needy. If you can help the needy, help the needy. And remember, Allah doesn't need your money. You know, Allah doesn't need your money. We were sitting in a mosque once, the gulla is over there. And a guy walked in, local, he knows where the gulla is. He came to me, he goes, Maulana, aap apne haathon se usme dalo. I goes, you put it in, you just walk past it. What's wrong with you? He said, no, no, you put it in. So look, the point that I'm trying to make is when we give in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, your right hand should give it, your left hand should not. No. And in the same way, we do everything for the sake of Allah. So he stopped. He didn't write anymore. He said, take this and go. So she went. She went to the governor of Iraq. And as we know, it takes a number of days to get there. When she gets there, same again, people, good people helping people. So she gets there. She hands that note to the governor. And when the governor reads that Umar bin Abdulaziz, he's written all this, he starts, he bursts into tears and he starts crying. He says, Umar bin Abdulaziz, has just passed away. He's just passed away. So this that he's written for you, it doesn't count unless the, the person that comes on the throne now approves it. The person that comes on the throne now approves it. So he says, we'll get it approved. But at the same time, this person, he says that if the new king says that he's not going to give you anything, then I will give it to you from my own pocket because of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. So look in the month of Ramadan, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to give charity. He used to give so much, so much. I just came back from Pakistan just recently. I was there two weeks. You know, we're doing some charity work. You know, you look at the people. You know, we were handing food parcels out. You can't just hand food parcels out like that. You take the Sharafti card, you take the form, you get it stamped by the Wadera of the village. Then they come and then they give you, you give them their food parcels. And you know, many people are just dying of just hunger. They haven't got anything to eat. We were there. And um, there was an elderly person with his daughter whose husband has passed away and they've got little, little children. They said we've walked approximately five to six miles. They can't afford a raksha, which is 100 rupees, which is 50p. They can't afford. Because we've walked a number of miles. We've come over here because people are saying that they're distributing food over here today, this foundation. So are we entitled to anything? So I spoke to someone and they said they're not entitled to anything. The reason being is they haven't got their shnafti card, they haven't got their farm. We need to take this and then they need to come to the next place or the next time we distribute. So I said to them that they're not going to give you anything. So he's going to say, so he goes, what, you know, what are we supposed to do? Then where are we supposed to eat from? Where is my daughter supposed to eat from? Where are my children, grandchildren supposed to eat from? So now if we go out and we spend on ourselves, think about these people. You know, so many people that are doing iftar, sahri and iftari for a pound. So you give a pound. Sahri and iftari, someone gets a nice meal. Some people are doing it for two pounds, some people are doing it at 250. There's wheelchairs that are needed. There was a guy that came for wheelchairs, a husband and a wife that came for wheelchair. Honest to God, always thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah's blessed you with beautiful health. You can walk, you can talk. Honest to God, when I seen these two children, a boy and a girl, difference one year in between them, they can't even sit up. They can't even sit up. The father is, uh, you know, if you go into my WhatsApp, you probably see it. Uh, the father is lifting them up. The father is lifting them up, then he lifts the girl up, then he lifts the boy up, and he says, can you give us a wheelchair? And you know, are you supposed to say to them that, oh, prove it, that your children know? You can see. So there's so many projects that you give, can give towards. In the month of Ramadan, give, even if it's a little bit. Many people are, are due to give their zakat before the month of Ramadan, and, but they wait, and they say that we'll give it in the month of Ramadan. That's not right. You know, if it's, a, if it's due in Muharram, if it's due in Safar, then give it. You know, give it to the people. And like I said to you before, there's so many people that are very, very needy in our UK. In our UK. So preparation for Ramadan, you know, trying to benefit yourself, trying to do some ibadah tonight, trying to focus, trying to concentrate. You know, make this Ramadan matter. You know, you walk away from this Ramadan and you think, you know, this year I cracked it. This year I did it. This year I did something. Isal is, is Ramadan. You know, if you were to die and stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can say, Ya Allah, I tried. I tried. There's no one else's door that you can knock on. At least you can say to him, Ya Allah, I carried on knocking on your door. So walk away from here and think, if we're not going to change our lives now, then when or what is it going to take? What is it going to take for me to change my life? You know, sometimes it's too late. Sometimes we run out of time. 
so many people you're speaking to, you're speaking to, the, to them, and in the morning, Fajr Salah, you receive a message that person's passed away. So take something away from here, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make this night matter, make the Ramadan matter, stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, I tried my best. I tried my best. Allah is looking for just, you know, on the Day of Judgment, your scales. If it's just one neki that tips it, then your bad deeds. He's not asking for 99, is he? He's not asking for 99 out of 100. He's only asking for your good deeds to tip your bad deeds. So that means we're all going to have bad deeds. All he's asking for is that one deed to tip that scale. So maybe that one pound that you gave in Ramadan, maybe that might just tip the scales on the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept everything that we said. Jazakallah for sitting and Jazakallah for listening and take something away from here. You know, if you're going to sit here and just walk away from here and think everything's cool, Molly did a sick bayan, everything was good, we're all going to chill out now, we're going to start listening to Tupac now. Then you're just going to flush everything away. Walk away from here and think to yourself, how can I better my life? Surah Mulk, very, very important. Take it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammadin wa barik wa sallim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Rabbana la tuzigh qulubana ba'da idha daytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka antal wahab. Rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurata a'yunin wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكون من الخاسرين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير يا الله all the sins that we have committed minor and major يا الله forgive these sins يا الله all the sins that we have committed in the darkness of the night يا الله forgive these sins يا الله all these sins that we have committed in the open daylight يا الله forgive these sins Ya Allah, forgive all the sins that we have committed and we have forgotten about, yet your angels have written them in the book of deeds. Ya Allah, wipe all these sins clean. Ya Allah, wipe all the sins clean that we still know that we have committed and we are committing. Ya Allah, wipe these sins as well. Ya Allah, make this night blessed for us. Ya Allah, make, give us the tawfiq to get close to you. Ya Allah, put your love inside our heart. Ya Allah, put your love inside our heart. Ya Allah, put your love inside our heart. Ya Allah, in our heart it should only be you. Ya Allah, anything that we do should only be for you. Ya Allah, put the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inside our heart. Put the love of Mecca and Medina inside our heart. Ya Allah, put the love of Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in inside our heart. Ya Allah, put the love of Salah inside our heart. Put the love of, put the love of asking from you inside our heart. Put the love of our parents inside our heart. Ya Allah, every single minute that passes, Ya Allah, we are either going towards Jannah or either we are going towards Jahannam. Ya Allah, every single step and every single minute that passes, Ya Allah, give us the tawfiq to get close to Jannah al Firdaus. And Ya Allah, as long as we live in this world, give us the tawfiq to practice Islam. And Ya Allah, when we leave this world, Ya Allah, give us the tawfiq to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, give us a tawfiq to say this so many people that we hear about that on their deathbed they cannot utter la ilaha illallah ya Allah protect us guide us and give us a tawfiq to say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and give us the tawfiq to memorize surah mulk give us a tawfiq to memorize surah mulk and make the benefit of surah mulk give us the benefit that it protects us in the grave and ya Allah all the stages in the hereafter ya Allah make it easy for us make it easy for us and ya Allah on the day of judgment Get Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to recognize us from far. And Ya Allah, give us the blessed water from the Hawza Kaus and from the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Ya Allah, there's many people that are going to wake up from their graves and their rides are going to be ready and they're going to be taken into Jannah al Firdaus. Ya Allah, without Hisab and Kitab, make every single one that is sitting over here from one of them that when the grave opens and when he stands up, the, the angels are standing there with his ride and taking directly into Jannah. Ameen, Ya Rabbul Alameen, Ya Allah, our loved ones that have passed away, Ya Allah, bless them, Jannah, Ya Allah, give them the highest rank in Jannah. Anyone that is ill, Ya Allah, cure them. Anyone that is going through any hardship, taklif, duk, ranj, gham, musibat, Ya Allah, make it easy for them. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya Rahman.